Imagine you're a designer working for intelligence systems or developing your own ROM hack. You're making the final chapter and are trying to create a fun final boss. You have a lot to consider as you plug in HP, defense, and resistance values along with every other stat. While doing so, you're asking the same question you have to ask when you've created every other enemy on the final map and almost all the enemies of the late game. What tools does the player have? What units? What stats? What weapons do they have? This is the challenge that all Fire Emblem entries face in their late games. How do you develop fun and engaging challenges while also accounting for the tools that the player will have available to them? After all, many items are missable, and permadeath means that each player's available cast is highly variable. I've talked at length about the problems permadeath can bring to the table in a previous video, the case against resetting, but there is one more problem in Fire Emblem's core design that presents massive problems. Growth rates. Growth rates, put simply, are the odds that a character will gain a stat upon level up. Because the overwhelming majority of characters in the franchise have growth rates below 100%, it means that level ups are almost always binary. You either get a point in a stat, or you don't. This means that level ups can vary wildly, with some level ups giving the character a point in every stat, or in some games giving completely empty levels where they gain nothing. Variable level ups aren't uncommon. Pokemon has level ups that are fairly random, at least to casual players. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door level ups give the player three mutually exclusive options for stat gains, and many RPGs from Final Fantasy VII to Dungeons and Dragons have some degree of variance in stat acquisition. The unique aspect to Fire Emblem is that the variance is almost always between zero and one, meaning that characters can exist in stasis even after many level ups, getting better is not a guarantee. This leads us to today's resident take. Growth rates are bad. They're bad because it makes it nearly impossible for the designers to know what exactly players will have during the late stages of the game, and that, as a mechanic, it's self-indulgent, existing only for itself and making the job of designing significantly harder. It's an aesthetic feature that fractures the design the deeper each game goes. Yet, the aesthetic experience of growth rates is so strong that the mechanic becomes one of the core, unique appeals of the series, well worth its negative implications, and, as this video will explore, there are ways to mitigate those negative effects while retaining the pleasure of the growth rate system. Part 2. An Aesthetic Pleasure. Pain and Agony. I said growth rates are primarily an aesthetic experience. Here's what I mean. Growth rates place the designers in a situation where they have limited knowledge of player tools. Yet, very rarely will individual stats make much of a difference. A single point of speed and defense, which are usually the best stats in the game, almost never changes anything. It's even less a difference for dump stats like skill and luck. While expert players will be able to list off all the stat thresholds that matter, these thresholds are dwarfed by every other meaningless stat point that a character gains throughout their lifetime. In his video Spreadsheet Emblem, Combat Effectiveness, Excelblum explains it like this. When you hit the speed threshold to double, that particular speed point is worth more to your, towards your combat success than the one directly before or after it. The same can be said about strength. The point of strength that ensures you one round an enemy is worth more than the points before or after it. See, in his hypothetical, 16 speed is the threshold where doubling occurs. He shows the virgin 15 and 17 speed as meaningless, but it's worse than that. 9 speed matters because it prevents a character from getting doubled, but everything from 10 speed to 15 makes little difference against the majority of enemies. And this is for a banger stat like speed. The thresholds for luck and skill are much murkier and farther between. By the way, in this video, Excelblum uses a spreadsheet detailing every enemy in the Sacred Stone's Erica route. It's a mad and remarkable feat of stat analysis. You should go watch it. Link's in the description. So if most individual points of each stat are meaningless, why does that level up screen command such power in Fire Emblem? Because honestly... Mm -hmm. Oh! Mm -hmm. Oh! Oh! oh. <laughs> Getting up. For many players, it's the most exciting part of the gameplay. Yeah, there's cool critical animations, intense strategy, nail-biting enemy phases, and adventure. But 
It's on that level up screen that everything comes together. That crazy risk you just took to get out of a hairy situation, that kill you perfectly set up for your trainee character, a big enemy phase for an up and coming character, all of it comes home on the level up screen. It's your reward for smart and clever play. But before we look at this Mozu level up from Fate's Birthright, let's remember that most of the stats that will pop up here are meaningless. They won't change much of anything for poor Mozu on their own, but what they represent is critical. For one, these stats are your reward for smart play. It's fun to feel rewarded. And two, these stats are a down payment for future success. This one point of speed you're hoping for won't mean much now, but when it adds up with every other point of speed, the payoff will be so sweet and so well worth the effort. Or maybe you're leveling up a supreme Chad like Seth or Robin. Each stat will represent just a little bit more disrespect for the poor enemies that lay ahead. Let's roll that Mozu level up. Yeah, that didn't go so well. This is from a stream I've done with Speedy Hawk where we're playing Fate's Birthright, and this Mozu has had very cursed level ups, at least at the time of writing. The reaction from Speedy has been to bench Mozu after several bad level ups, but why? Why should bad level ups make her worse when most of the stats she missed out on wouldn't make much of a difference anyway? There are many controllable aspects that make level ups meaningless in training Mozu. There are pair up bonuses, promotion gains, tonics, and building weapon ranks for access to stronger weapons. None of these are affected by the level up screen, yet the level up screen commands more power than all of these other mechanics. All level up screens throughout the series function similarly, so let's go to a GBA level up screen and see how they're built aesthetically. A giant portrait of the character pops up in a stat screen, and then each stat ticks off. The style of level up screen is ridiculous and beautiful and is the core of growth rates as an aesthetic experience. A level up screen doesn't need to be built like this. Many RPGs straight up don't show you gain stats and most don't have this level of fanfare. And very few stagger each stat popping the way Fire Emblem does. In Pokemon, the entire level up pops at once. By staggering the stats, Fire Emblem makes its level up screen a little drama with a bit of suspense in there. When you get here, you don't know what you'll get, so why not drag out the results a little longer? Sometimes you get blessed with an avalanche of dings. Other times, deafening silence. This is what I mean when I say growths are an aesthetic feature. Level ups don't mean much on their own, yet the fanfare that surrounds level ups as well as the way level up screens are constructed make the act of leveling up a more impactful experience than the actual product of a level up. And sometimes, level ups feel so good, and other times so, so bad. Part 3. Growth rates can't be built around. Let's think about two things that may at first seem contradictory. The idea that level ups don't matter, and that growths make it impossible for designers to predict what a player will have at any given point, especially during the late game. You see, level ups, they don't matter by themselves, but what happens when you expand outwards to 20 or more level ups? Now we're talking about problems. Let's say you level up little Franz from the Sacred Stones all the way from chapter 1 to chapter 18. You get him to level 15, promoted him to Paladin, and then you got him about level 5? On average, Franz will have these stats. But these stats right here are also possible. As are these. That is some variance, and the game has no idea which one of these Franzes you'll have. And the same applies for every other character in the game. Unless it's Erica or Ephraim, every other character in Sacred Stones could be dead, and even if they're alive, most of them could be horribly stat screwed. As a designer, putting together the final handful of maps, you want them to be epic and have this massive scale you envision to climax your story, but you don't know what the player has, what characters are alive, and what are their stats. You, you don't know. Neither does Intelligent Systems. Let's see how various Fire Emblem games handle this problem. The Sacred Stones and Path of Radiance throw hordes of weak enemies at the player. Just about every team composition a player has can handle massive maps like Clash, but these late maps with masses of weak enemies often end up being slogs where blue and red units just kind of smash into each other. Awakening goes in the opposite direction, with its late maps having hordes of very powerful enemies. The logic here being that while level ups are random, the game has pair up and what is essentially infinite level up opportunities with second seals. 
As well, the designers probably wanted players to focus on the sandbox aspects of building characters. In practice, though, it usually just results in players juggernauting with a small army. The games that have these particularly sloggy late games show how growth rates hamstring the design process since it's difficult to design a game around having almost no idea what the player has. This large hole in design is why I almost invariably find the late games to be the most boring part of any Fire Emblem. There is rarely curated difficulty, with many late game maps being spammy, sloggy, too easy, or too hard. Sometimes, the games do find interesting non-combat challenges. The Gorgon Egg map in Sacred Stones is all about moving as fast as possible in multiple different directions. This is an incredibly fun chapter, but not every chapter can be this. The game should also be testing the player's ability to manage complex player and enemy phase challenges, but making those carefully crafted challenges is relentlessly difficult when there are almost no certains. This is why growths are not good game design. They make designing good and interesting challenges progressively more difficult as the game grinds on. Coupled with permadeath, the amount of possible army compositions a player can have is nearly limitless. Yet to say that growth rates and variable level ups are bad game design is only true collectively. They have a negative effect on the rest of the design. But as a standalone mechanic, growths are a small stroke of macabre genius. The aesthetic pleasure and pain from the level up screen is the most fun a human can possibly have staring at a list of fictional numbers, and it's a core appeal to Fire Emblem, the experience of growing and building something better. Then, if growths are worth keeping around, what can the games do, and what have they done to mitigate the problems caused by variable growths? Part 4. Controlling Chaos Growth rates introduce chaos, so the key to grappling with the ever-catastrophizing effects of variability is to place as many control valves in the games as possible. Here's the controls that the games place to mitigate the long-term ramifications of RNG. The key is giving the player tools to augment stats that are entirely independent of level ups. Here are some of those tools. 1. Weapon Ranks From Thracia 776 all the way up to 3 houses, characters build weapon rank at a rate equal to how often they're using each weapon type. The higher a weapon rank, the more powerful weapons a character can use. If a character is strength screwed, they can augment that missing strength with killer weapons, braves, and silvers. If they're skill screwed, they can use more accurate iron and silver weapons and leave the steels and blades in the backpack. Number two, supports. Supports come in all shapes and sizes, from the automatic supports of Thracia 776 that provide plus 10 hit, avoid, critical, and critical avoid, the slow burn, GBA, and Path of Radiance supports that provide a variety of buffs from hit, avoid, attack, defense, and so on, and the pair up bonuses in Awakening and Fates. Not only can all these bonuses patch up weak stats, they can also stack strong stats to create crit kings and dodge tanks. Number three, is this character not mage killing hard enough? Chug a pure water or take a barrier staff to the face. These types of consumables can provide a temporary patch to weak stats. From new mystery of the emblem to today, many new items and mechanics have been added to give temporary buffs to all stats. Tonics and cooking give characters the temporary buffs they may need in the meantime. Number four, Forging. Like weapon ranks, forging is an even more extreme version of augmenting strength and skill. If a character, Oscar, is hitting them with the wet noodle, just juice up a weapon with some more might and more hit. This is a resource that can be dedicated to helping get specific characters back on track or shared between the army to make sure everyone has the might they need to tackle the enemies. Number five, bonus experience and grinding. Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn give the player bonus experience, a resource of free experience they can dump on any character they want. If a character is lagging, pop them a few levels to hopefully give them a leg up. While there is no guarantee to these levels in Path of Radiance, Radiant Dawn will give a character three stats when they level up through bonus experience. Shadows of Valentia also provides this by giving every character a bit of bonus experience at the end of each battle. Many other games also give access to more experience through grinding. Just about every game in the series has extra battles the player can use for more experience or an arena, a gorgeous risk-reward device that lets players gamble away their characters' lives for experience and money. Those are five basic tools that the games have given players to circumvent the problems that growths can create. Not all of them are foolproof, and not all of them are great mechanics. Grinding in particular is a blunt tool that adds little of value. This list also isn't comprehensive. 
There are many other large and small tools that the games give players to allow them to augment stats, but none of this gets rid of the core problem. Characters are expected to grow, but there is no guarantee they will. While only a small number of thresholds matter for characters, these thresholds still have to be met. There are certain scaffolds in place to help the player meet these thresholds. GBA Fire Emblem rerolls blank level ups and Radiant Dawn, Fates, and Three Houses don't allow most characters to blank a level up. Using star shards and scrolls, players can growth stack characters in Mystery of the Emblem Book 2 and Thracia 776. However, none of this eases the problem for a designer of not knowing how characters grew and what tools the player has. So while the games give you a lot of tools in the moment to augment stats from turn to turn, what can designers do on a macro scale to ensure players always have the proper tools and that the challenges are more interesting than overpowered or underpowered enemy spam? One way is to eliminate the risk of power creeping entirely. Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, Mystery of the Emblem, and Thracia 776 capped all stats except HP at 20 for both players and enemies. This means there's a limit to how hard enemies can get. In Mystery of the Emblem in particular, it means it's hard to get steamrolled by the enemies, but it's also difficult for the player to steamroll enemies. These low caps combined with the growth stacking star shards ensure that player and enemies are almost always on even footing. Thracia 776 is a little different as enemies are weak throughout almost the entire game, and scrolls combined with ridiculous personal weapons and a buff support system make it easy for the player to overwhelm enemies. Since most combat challenges can be trivialized, the challenges come more from managing enemy inventory. Identifying and neutralizing enemies with powerful weapons and staves becomes the name of the game, especially in places like Chapter 24, where enemies will be pumping you full of sleep, silence, and berserk from a difficult-to-access room. Not many people have played Thracia 776, so let's look at the more commonly played GBA games to see in action this philosophy of making enemy placement and loadout the challenge. Chapter 18 of the Sacred Stones, which I mentioned earlier, starts with just a few enemies on the map, including an enemy with a very nasty siege tome. But most of the map is populated by a bunch of eggs that will hatch slowly as the map drags on. The goal is to kill every enemy, and it only gets harder with the more eggs that the player lets hatch. The challenge is therefore much more about maximizing movement. Rush down the siege tomes, which you can bait out with summons or use pure water and barrier boosted units to charge them. For the rest of the map, split up your army to charge the eggs and effectively identify and destroy the ones closer to hatching to continue buying your army turns. The only stats that really matter in Chapter 18 are movement, which is a fixed constant and not affected by level ups, and resistance, which can be greatly augmented by barrier and pure water. This is all great, but can you create similar types of fairly stat independent challenges in combat heavy maps? Sure, why not? Let's look at Chapter 22 of The Blazing Sword. This isn't a late game map, but the principles here can still be applied to late game maps. This is a defend chapter, and in my opinion, it's one of the few defend chapters that gets better each playthrough rather than worse. You can hold out for 11 turns or end the map early by killing the boss, and there's even some snazzy side objectives, a few treasure chests, a couple of optional characters to recruit in Wrath and Heath, and a secret shop for the game fax users among us. The big gimmick of the map is that most of the enemies are loaded out with reaver weapons. These are powerful weapons that reverse and double the effects of the weapon triangle, a mechanic that is functionally almost always in the player's favor. This means that the challenge isn't so much reaching benchmarks, but leveraging the weapon triangle to give your characters massive boosts to avoid strength and defense. This isn't to say that stats don't matter in this map, but deficiencies can be circumvented by taking advantage of the enemy's loadout, and hey, just in case you need some extra firepower, the game gives you the blue paint palette in Isadora to make sure you have the combat stats necessary to take on the map. She might not have the greatest unit feel in the world, but she helps the player clear the map and is a safeguard to make sure the player isn't screwed. Pre-promoted characters like Isadora are actually generally a good way to also circumvent the problems that growths present. Some people dog on the Blazing Sword for giving the player too many stonk pre-promotes like Harkin, Hawkeye, Athos, Pent, and somehow even more than that. The advantage of these characters is that they set benchmarks that intelligent systems can design around, knowing that the player will have a nice little stream of strong characters coming into their army. To summarize everything, you have more characters like Flavia and Basilio, and less maps like Chapter 19 and Endgame from Awakening. Like, holy shit, fuck, 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 this is awful. 
More maps that build challenges around enemy formation and loadout than sheer stats. This way the games can indulge in the beauty of growth rates without having to be at the mercy of the problems caused by growth rates. It's a mechanic that adds nothing except for aesthetic pleasure. And that, I think, is something worth celebrating. Videos like this are made possible by my generous patrons over at Patreon. If you would like to support the channel and future video essays like this, please consider following the link in the description to become a patron now for many great benefits, including getting your names read at the end of every video essay, such as these fine fellows right here. Anime Gogogo, -Go, Ascended Bagels, Belk Narum, BMO McGrim, Boo Zero Oots 42, Kate Rose, Dector A, Enigmatic Mr. L, Estjuice, Exod, Henny G, Kinsey, Nin, Pangus Khan, Sword Locked, That Icarus Kid, Two Clutch, Uther 007, Will Brock, Zetetic, Z O P Lord, A L Mandite, Besipedal, E Dub, Forrest McFarland, Joe Underscore, Logjam, Major, Melissa G, Mozu Pog, Nathaniel Peters, Neo Sigma, Puzzles B, Jinshin, Stephanie Roman, William Clemens, Willem, Yokai, Anton Nielsen, Dabney, Faye Nettius, Gilga Messed Up, G Merck, Jameson, Little Beats, Lucas DM, No Offense, Noe is perfectly legal. Reflectga. Thomas G. Grow. T. Kloss 45. Vivian Aladrin. And Zachary Parrish. Thank you all for your support, and I will see you all next time.